Hi all of you awesome scuba divers out there. A bit of an awareness video today with a scuba divers account from Divers Alert Network. Now, we're gonna run through the account and I'm gonna highlight any red flags for me that if you encounter whilst you're diving, it may be worth asking a professional or contacting Dan, even if it's just to dispel any worries. It's always better to mention any odd feelings or worries that you may have because Whilst it may not seem like anything significant to you, it may actually be something a bit more sinister. Scuba.com is your one-stop shop to find all of the top scuba diving brands from the classic big brands like Aqualung, Atomic, Cressy Mares, Scuba Pro, as well as new and exciting brands. As well as having their online dive store that offers free shipping and a pressure-free fit guarantee, where if your suit doesn't fit you quite right, then Scuba.com will send you the next size and collect the wrong one free of charge. But yes, Scuba.com is far more than just a website full of shiny new diving equipment. They also have two dive shops, one near Newport Beach in California and the other on West 17th Street in Manhattan. Here you can try on and buy diving equipment and scuba.com also teaches scuba diving classes. They run guided scuba diving tours, they service diving equipment and they have the Pacific Coast Dive Club if you want to join up and get some diving in. If you're in the market for some new scuba diving equipment then head over to scuba.com. It's a really easy website to remember. Uh, it's literally scuba.com or you can click on this link up here or there's gonna be the same one down in the description underneath this video. The account itself doesn't go into any great details about the conditions or the location of the diving or the actual dive profiles, uh, but here's how it starts. My buddy and I dived six out of seven days on my last trip. Our profile allowed an hour of dive times with two tank dives and the recommended interval. We usually dive every other day at the end of the trip, but our last two diving days were successive due to the weather. On the last dive, we started our return to the boat with half a tank of air left, stopped at around seven and a half meters to observe the area. I was briefly separated from my buddy as I followed a tile fish before continuing my ascent and making my safety stop in view of the other divers and our dive master. I may have slightly shortened my safety stop to get back to the dive master in time to follow along to the boat. First red flags here, uh, separating from your buddy is always a bad thing and one of the leading causes of buddy separation is gonna be distractions from local wildlife or something interesting. If I spot something in the water, my first reaction is actually to look for my buddy, make sure they're where I expect them to be and if they're actually paying attention to me because there's no point in me following them in this direction, if they haven't even seen the thing, they're continuing in that direction as a real easy way to get separated. However, the more important red flag for me is cutting the safety stop short to keep up with the group. Depending on the dive profile, a safety stop isn't always essential. It's a safety stop, you put that on at the end just as a, an extra safety buffer. That being said, unless there's some mitigating circumstance, I'm going to spend as much time on a safety stop as I can. We've already learned that the diver and the buddy still have plenty of gas left in their cylinders. Just because the dive master is heading up to the surface doesn't mean that you have to follow them as soon as they start to ascend. The story continues, after surfacing and removing my BCD, I developed frontal chest pain. It was unusual, but I thought it was from muscle strain from removing my BCD. My left hip was somewhat painful and hindered me whilst getting out of the water, but that is normal. When I sat down in the boat, my chest and hip pain were gone. I took off the rest of my gear and whilst moving around the boat, I felt my left leg slightly give way. We're starting to get into big red flag territory to immediately alert the dive guide and start on oxygen. Aches and pains develop as you grow older and scuba diving is a physically demanding sport, but aches, pains and weakness, even in common areas, are worth noting and talking about. 
especially if they come and go when compressed. Remember that decompression illnesses are caused when dissolved gases in your tissues come out of solution when the pressure is relieved around you and they form bubbles. By sitting down, you're compressing that area and putting pressure on the joint, which can alleviate that pain. When you then stand up, the bubbles form again and the pain returns. Unusual weakness can be a sign of a neurological bend. At this point, I'd want to be on oxygen and monitoring any other signs or symptoms. Back at the hotel, things seemed normal. I showered and stored my gear, but then noticed the muscles in my left thigh twitching and showed my buddy. After checking the internet for decompression illness symptoms, I determined that it was likely fatigue causing my twitching. I hydrated and ate some carbohydrates, but I noted I did not need to urinate, which was strange. As time passed, I was still unable to urinate despite the urge. A hot shower soon after a scuba dive is considered a bad idea. Whether you suspect decompression illness or not, even after a completed decompression stop and safety stops, you still have dissolved gases in your body that you still need to dispel. The problem is, is that if you stayed on the safety stop underwater until you off-gassed completely, you'd be there for hours. So there are acceptable levels of dissolved gases that we can surface with and continue to off-gas on the surface. By jumping in a hot shower after a scuba dive, you can accelerate decompression, usually in the skin. So far, signs and symptoms of decompression illness include chest pain, joint pain, weakness in the legs, twitching, and a change in the normal constitution. Signs and symptoms of decompression illness can be so hard because they're often so broad and they're different between patients. One can exhibit certain signs and symptoms, others can display completely separate ones, but they can have the same decompression illness. It's, it's a bit of a spectrum as far as signs and symptoms. But now that they're experiencing weakness and an inability to urinate, they go on to say that it became clear that something serious was happening and I considered that I was ha likely having DCI symptoms. I went to the island's hospital where I received high flow oxygen and intravenous hydration. Thankfully, they also placed a urinary catheter to give me some relief. The examining physician determined I had a loss of sensation in my legs, especially heat sensitivity and muscle weakness in my left quadriceps. Spot on. Seek medical care and they put the diver straight on oxygen and hydration. The catheter is a bit more case specific. That's not a standard procedure in every case of decompression illness. We're also adding a loss of feeling as a symptom, a bit of numbness, but specifically numbness to heat. DCI can cause increased sensitivity and reduced sensitivity. It's very tricky to diagnose. I had delayed getting care for nearly eight hours and due to the island having no hyperbaric chamber, I did not receive recompression treatment until the following evening, more than 24 hours later. I'm a primary care internal medicine physician, so I should have known to get help from a dive specialist as soon as I had strange symptoms. Treatment entirely resolved my symptoms six months after the incident, but if I had sought treatment earlier, my recovery might have been quicker and the treatment possibly less intense. Decompression treatment is rarely just a couple of hours in a chamber and you're done. It's not unusual for regular treatments to continue for weeks after the dive, and like so many medical conditions, the sooner you can begin treatment, the better. Also consider, as is in this case, there aren't decompression chambers on every street corner or even every hospital. And how are you gonna get there? By aeroplane? You can't die, you can't go on a plane soon after a dive. So you have to think about those kind of logistics when you're planning where you're diving. So what can we learn from this testimony? So the first thing is to avoid the need for treatment altogether. And that starts on the dive. And we're already in gray areas. The shortened safety stop may not have been the leading cause of this incident, but it is a likely contributor. We also need to consider the change in activity levels. The re they reported that they increased their dive schedule from diving every other day to successive days. So 
you might be a little bit more worn out. Your body may find it a bit harder to decompress as efficiently because you're a bit more tired. And even if the diver did complete the safety stop, there are still undeserved bends. The dive computer doesn't know how tired or cold you are, whether you're well hydrated or what you've been doing between dives. They are set to have a safety buffer for average Joe divers body health, but just because the dive computer said that everything is okay to ascend, it's never a 100% guarantee. Unless you absolutely need to exit the water, try to spend as much time on that safety stop as you can bear. Immediately after the dive, we start to see signs and symptoms of decompression illness. They aren't always immediate. It isn't always the case where a diver exits the water and immediately starts to feel something. Only about 40% of symptoms start to appear in the first hour. Most display within the first 24 hours. Somewhat innocuous sensations and things that you can feel or see on another diver do need to be noted. For example, I hurt my shoulder a few years ago, but if I ever feel any pain or numbness in my shoulder, I won't just put it down to tendonitis because it could be something else. You might feel like you're being a bit of a hypochondriac by mentioning every little twinge and feel that, you, that you're feeling, but just mention anything odd to your dive guide, anything that you're feeling, and try to monitor it yourself as well. Take note of the time when it first manifested and if it changes later on for the better or the worse. Just take a note of times when you're starting to notice these things. I tend to keep an old accident management work slate in my kit bag with me on a dive. It takes up very little space, but it can help to keep things organized and you can keep track of symptoms as this information is gonna be really useful for doctors looking to plan your treatment. If it turns out to be nothing, great. Just erase the slate for the next dive. If it is something, then that information is very valuable, especially because decompression illness can sometimes cause confusion, drowsiness, and unconsciousness. So if you're unconscious, they're not going to know any of that information unless you have it written down. If you're ever in doubt about scuba diving and decompression illness, then it's best just to contact medical professionals such as Divers Alert Network just to get their opinion. If you have any scuba diving stories that other divers can learn from, then type them down in the comments below this video, along with anything that you've learned from this diving account. Remember to like this video if you did learn anything new, and subscribe to the channel for more scuba diving videos. Thank you for watching everybody, and of course, safe diving.